major thing, and I don't know how much time I'm going to take to do this, but I want to talk about the uh, the new uh, uh, financial infrastructure that is uh, facing the world and facing America in particular. Uh, it's going to really affect us more uh, than it will other people. It'll affect us negative, negatively while it'll affect other people positively. And so we have to understand that and get ourselves positioned properly uh, for that. The, uh, now let me um, start out by, uh, it appears that we have a, a division between uh, the East and the West. And I'm going to draw a, a chart like that. And in the, we'll put over here, this is the West, this is the East. Uh, in the world, and in the in the West, we have the Federal Reserve, and uh, along with that, we have Bank of England, etc. You know that kind of stuff. We're all kind of part of the same team. In the East, they have the People's Bank of China that has been uh, established. Uh, the and it's growing. It's a massive bank. Uh, the People's Bank of China is uh, moving to international in the international finance. In uh, in the West, we have the International Monetary Fund. And what uh, what has been happening is people all over, over the world have found that the International Monetary Fund has been the piggy bank uh, for the United States and the European countries and has not been international at all. It hasn't been providing funds to South America or Asia or whatever, you know. It's just the friends and, and, uh, and family of the of, uh, US and Britain, essentially. And so what happened was uh, that it needed to be uh, a full international system. So what, in order to bring pressure, China created the Asia Investment, uh, in, uh, International Investment Bank. Infrastructure, inve in infrastructure Investment Bank. And they, they are uh, set up uh, to act just about like, uh, like uh, the United States um, IMF uh, it does. Now, if we look at, see if I can find my, my uh, no, that's not it. Here we are. This is, this is a map of the founding members of the AIIB. And uh, uh, China makes up the whole thing and essentially what happens is all the green nations are the ones that are in it. And so this is an organization that's equivalent to the um, IMF. And the people who are not in it are the United States, Greenland, uh, you know, nations in Africa, a few nations here. But most of the world is in it, including um, England, the United Kingdom. So you can see that these are all make up uh, the um, AIIB, and uh, and uh, all of these na other nations are members of IMF, but the United States is not a member of the AIIB. And so what they've done is they the East has set up uh, an organization to counter the IMF. And uh, then what over here we have, we have the World Bank. And uh, it wasn't doing things for the world, it was doing things for us. And so over here they created the BRICS Bank. This is, in the BRICS Bank is uh, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And the BRICS, BRICS nations are, uh, well, let's see. We don't need to cover that right now. So we, we, have, we, have, we have the BRICS Bank. And so what they did was they created another equivalent. We have SWIFT, which is the financial money transfer system for the world that transfers money all around the world. And so uh, the SWIFT system is, a, is located in Belgium. It has a Belgian organization. 
and nations join it. Uh, you know, all the nations of the world have joined SWIFT because they want to have the ability to wire transfer money around the world, to transfer between banks and etc. Well, the United States uh, created a, uh, a situation where much of, because we are the world's reserve currency, much of the world was tra doing trading in U.S. dollars, and the United States says we want to approve every U.S. dollar trade in the world. So what happened is they set up the big computer centers in Washington, D.C., and all of the swift translation, uh, tra uh, transactions that happen in, in Belgium are forwarded to, all the dollar uh, ones are forwarded to Washington, D.C., and the United States government approves every dollar transaction. So what happens is Russia, China, major nations are transferring funds around the world, which they use U.S. dollars to do much of that, and so the United States government is watching everything that Russia is doing, everything that China is doing, and they're controlling whether or not they'll permit this money to go through. They're giving a yes or no one. So what happens that the, these nations decided they didn't like that. So what, the, what China did was they created what's called CIPS, C-I-P-S, which is China International Payment System. Uh, and they did this in uh, in 2016. Okay. Yes. Excuse me. Isn't Russia in there as well? Didn't they? Um, haven't they? Yes. Financially. Yeah, That's right. That was my next point. Thank you so much, Andy. Oh, my the, my wife is uh, understanding these things very well. <laughs> the uh, and so what happens is we now have the Russian uh, payment system has joined and and they've now they've now linked these two together. So and why did why did Russia have a, a decide to have a payment system? Because the United States threatened to keep them out, kick them out of the SWIFT money transfer system. We were holding this over their head. We will not allow you to transfer monies between your own banks within your own nation. So what what uh, Russia did is they now have 600 of their top banks on an international trading system, and these trading systems happen to be uh, uh, compatible with SWIFT. So now Russia and China and all of the nations in their sphere are now going to all be able to transfer monies back and forth and do deals without U.S. dollars and without U.S. approval. So that's, that's what's, uh, what's happening. Uh, then what happened is we had the... Uh, the uh, we had the London Bullion Market Association and well, plus uh, New York, and in that they take they take they took they controlled the price of gold. The price of gold was set in London and New York by these uh, individuals, the big bankers. Uh, they actually set it, and then they did whatever was necessary to keep the price where they wanted it. And they would, uh, they would do naked shorting, they would do all kinds of stuff in the market to control the price of gold. So what did, uh, what did the East do, what did China do? They put up the Shanghai Gold Exchange. And where, where the Shanghai Gold Exchange has been created in Shanghai just a couple of years ago, they now have futures contracts, they now have all kinds of contracts, they're putting together the, the, the system where, where Shanghai is going to be the area that controls uh, the, uh, the value of gold. And what Shanghai is doing is they're trading in real gold. They're not trading in paper gold or imaginary gold or synthetic gold or any other term <coughs> you want to use. They're trading in real gold. You buy the gold, you take it. That's it, you know. And, uh, and, that, and so what we, we expect is uh, uh, China has wanted gold price down for a long time because they're in the, the posture of accumulating gold. And so suppressing the price of gold was fine with them. Now we're coming into a time where the price of gold will be better if it's higher for them. And so we're, we're watching, they have put the, put the uh, system in, in place where they have market makers and all this kind of stuff uh, in, the, in the gold area. So what we have is we have 
a system where it appears there's a competing system against this system. It appears, and it definitely is, because if they didn't do this, we would never give up our power in this particular area. So in the meantime, what's happened is the IMF has created the SDR, and they've actually taken uh, the former head of the People's Bank of, of, of China, and he now sits on as the number two man at the IMF. So he sits, he sits over there. And uh, so we have this situation going on, but, uh, and people try to play this up, is this is a competing, competing system, and this system is out to destroy this system. Right. Uh, that's the way it's set. I don't think that's the way it is. And the reason is, because up here at the top, you have the BIS. The Bank of International Settlements is the bank that started the Fed and the IMF, and they are the people who are actually helping all of this stuff happen. So the Bank of International Settlements is actually putting, running this together. They're breaking the Western power, they're breaking the power of the West where our dollar is, over, is overvalued and, uh, and has been the uh, primary reserve currency. They're breaking the power of the dollar which is going to affect the United States of America. Uh, is what we, we've got going. So we have, we have these, these are the, the competing organizations, and so what we expect to see is these organizations being utilized in the new world system and actually working together. We're going to get into that as we go a little bit, a little bit further. The, uh, let me, uh, I'm going to go to a series of different pieces of paper here, interviews, knowledge, stuff that's coming out, and we have an apparent plan. Um, uh, what we have, let's do this. We're going to go over here, we're going to take a look at uh, this right here. We're going to look at this. Uh, this is the financial system in the United States of America since the founding, starting back here in 1770. And we've gone through different periods of time. And uh, we've gone through uh, 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 where we had a financial system backed by international gold, domestic paper, domestic gold, domestic silver, domestic paper, domestic silver, domestic paper, international gold uh, modified which was a, a gold-backed dollar, then the gold-backed dollar stopped, and we've been on the international paper dollar system right now. And this has been for the United States and most of the world. This is what, so we've gone through a variety of different financial systems already, and we're coming up right here to a, uh, a, another decision, and that is, what's, it what's the new system going to look like because we have a brand new system coming? Why? Because a paper fiat money system does not work. It ends up in a crisis, it's brought us to the crisis, and the crisis is ready to happen. Here is a, uh, a little hit, quick history of, of, of world currencies. Down here in the bottom is Portugal. Uh, this is down here at 1400 to like, uh, this is like 1540, right here. Uh, here we had, uh, we have Spain. They, they lasted uh, with 110 years. We had the Netherlands, uh, they, had, they lasted about 80 years as a reserve currency. France uh, uh, was uh, lasted 20, uh, 95 years. Uh, we had uh, the British pound that, that lasted 105 years. Uh, we have the United States dollar is going to last about 110 years. And the last thing coming up is the new international currency as a reserve currency. This is the SDR. This is, this is kind of like the history of the world. We're now transitioning from here to here. That's the, we're in that transition. And so when you're in the transition, that's when big things happen. Major, uh, major things occur at that particular time uh, as, we, um, as we watch it. Yes? How does Donald Trump play into all of this, switching into a, a national? How does Donald Trump play into it? Mm -hmm. Well, we are going to get to that. Okay. We're going to get to that. So what we have right now 
Oh. We've used this this uh, hand scratching uh, before. We've looked at this hand scratching before. This is what makes up the U.S. dollar right now. We have a domestic U.S. dollar that we have in the United States of America. This is our savings account, checking accounts, and actual cash. Works out to about 11.3, 11.8 trillion dollars here. Uh, then uh, in the rest of the world, rest of the world, much of the world has had they've had to buy uh, oil using U.S. dollars, and so. Because that there's so much of uh, money that's required in buying oil for nations that they call that the petrodollar. That is, nations have to keep U.S. dollars on hand just to be able to buy uh, oil. And then we have another thing called the euro dollar. And that is, other nations other than the United States that choose to use the dollar as their currency, or they are linked to the dollar. That's called the euro dollar. It doesn't have anything to do with the euro, euro Europe or the euro. It, it can be any nation anywhere, uh, but it is, it's, called, it's, it's ter referred to the euro dollar because they started out, nations started out in Europe using the dollar as their base, basis for doing business. And so there it was called the euro dollar. So th what's happening with the, 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 the petrodollar is going to go away because petrodollars are, uh, are, are, are not, petro is now going to be purchased, uh, international purchases are going to be done in SDRs. And the euro dollar is going to go away because that, that same thing is going to be. So these two, we don't need these things anymore. So over here, this equals about the same as what we have over here. This is about $12 trillion out there in the world under that. And so they don't, the world won't need that. Uh, they'll be sending those dollars home, but they're going to replace it with the SDRs. And the SDRs are composed of 40% U.S. dollars. So they're going to get rid of, let's say, they get rid of 100% U.S. dollars, and they're going to come back with 43% or something. They're going to be required in the new SDRs. So there's a big amount of U.S. dollars that are no longer needed in the U.S. economy. I mean, in the world economy. And they're going to be coming back to the United States. That, what does that do? That drives inflation. It just goes straight up you, and, and, um, in, the, uh, in that whole area. So I want you to... Um, I want you to see that, and uh, then what is an SDR? We've covered this right now. Uh, an SDR is special drawing rights. is composed of the euro, the British pound, U.S. dollar, a Japanese yen, and we've been theorizing: is this uh, is the IMF going to use gold somehow, or is China, China going to use gold somehow? We don't know uh, really uh, for sure, but the, the, the Chinese, new Chinese yuan is going to make up about 11% of the, uh, uh, <coughs> the SDR. So uh, when, you, when you take a look at it, this is the new international currency. It's made up of these five existing currencies. This is, this is uh, a before and after look. This is what it looked like before October. They were four, made up of four currencies. This is what it's made, uh, looks like after October 2016. This is where uh, the, uh, this is the US dollar and uh, Euro, uh, Japanese yen, and the, uh, this is the, the, uh, the Chinese yuan, and this is the, this is the British pound, yeah. This is a euro. So basically, this is what it looks. Like. This was what it looked like a few months ago. This is what it looks like now. And uh, of course, what happens is you can see Chinese yuan is down here at eleven percent. We're at forty-one percent uh, in the uh, uh, of the new SDR. However, everybody knows that China is close to, or um, or maybe surpassing us under some mark. So right now, the SDR is not allocated properly yeah. is China is way underrepresented on here and the United States is overrepresented on there and so you can look for that is going to begin to change in the future uh, that's going to begin, begin to change in the future and so then uh, here is the uh, here is the SDR fact sheet from the IMF the SDR is an international reserve asset created by the IMF in 1969 to supplement its 
member countries' official reserves. As of March uh, 2016, 204.1 billion SDRs, equivalent to about 285 billion, have been created and allocated to members. SDRs can be exchanged for freely uh, usable currencies. The value of the SDR is based on basket of five major currencies, US dollar, euro, the Chinese renminbi, the Japanese yen, the pound sterling, as of October 1st, 2016. You won't read the rest of it. What happens is, uh, if you notice that Ukraine needed a bailout recently, and we had two nations uh, trying to uh, uh, compete to help bail out uh, the Ukraine. One nation was the United States of America, and the other nation was Russia. They both offered to bail out Ukraine. This was a, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, something. Uh, they both offered. Well, the thing was, they both offered to bail out Ukraine in SDRs. Russia wasn't bailing them out in rubles, and the United States wasn't bailing them out in, uh, in uh, U.S. dollars. They both offered to bail them out in SDRs. So uh, you, you been get, begin to take a look at it and see what's uh, happening there. Um, here, are, um, here are the actual rates. Uh, on, you can go to IMF, and you can see <clears throat> these are the rates as of April the 21st that compose an SDR. And this is what, uh, what uh, one SDR equals $1.363 right now. That's how it's set up. The SDR is worth, is worth a little bit more than a U.S. dollar, the way it's set up. So we're, we're watching this, this, uh, this structure. This is the new financial structure. Uh, this is the unit uh, that, uh, that is going to be used in international trade between nations. Unless they, the nations will have the option of, of, of doing their own things apart from that. But basically, all the products, all the insurance products, all the, uh, the uh, hedging products that you need to do international trade are all being set up now in, included using SDRs. So uh, when we take a look at, at this, uh, we have here uh, from uh, J.C. Collins, uh, he writes this. He thinks this is what he has seen in his research the SDR compositions themselves will be based on both macro and micro weights and measures. The macro bre breakdown of each country's currency composition will be as follows. 25% production of commodities, such as oil, gas, rice, wheat, iron, etc., will be, will be a weighted factor for your currency, national currency. 25% will be in foreign reserves and in precious metals. <coughs> And 50% and will be in fiat, pegged to increase or decrease based on the fluctuating values of the above two factors. So basically, in this uh, scenario, what we're seeing is a partially backed uh, currency that is backed uh, based on formulas set up by the IMF on uh, the value of your oil, gas, rice, wheat, iron, etc., and also your foreign reserves. Uh, uh, and, and precious metals. Now, the United States of America does not have foreign reserves because we're the world reserve currency and we just created out of there. So we don't have to go out. So what, what happens is a normal nation, like if we were a normal nation, we would have to go out and, uh, and, uh, and put together uh, all kinds of foreign reserves. We'd have to have yuan and British pounds and etc. So we do have some, a few things, but we don't have much like what other nations would have. And so this is one thing that he's looking at in his research that he thinks, and now what he's done is he's gone to the, uh, he's gone to the financial uh, 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 sites themselves. He goes to the IMF, the World Bank, etc. He goes and he researches these things at that particular time. And, uh, and we see that uh, uh, this is what his conclusion is. I have felt that China is actually wanting to do uh, uh, a, a gold-backed currency, not kind of this, this, this way, that they want to do a gold-backed currency. Uh, I can see where you want to do this kind of thing for nations that don't make up the SDR. For instance, 
uh, some nation that's got uh, oil reserves and they've got or whatever diamonds or something you want to include that as a value of their local currency but uh, uh, there are nations that don't have gold so how would you do a gold you, you know gold back currency for a nation that has no gold you know that kind of thing it's like uh, well I can see where we could do uh, a gold back currency for the nations that are involved in making up the SDR and I can see this for other currencies that are a part of, of uh, uh, different things. So take a look at that. That is, uh, and so uh, what we see happening is uh, precious metals and you see uh, commodities, production, so gas, oil, uh, iron, ore, etc. What, what do you see? You see Trump going out and trying to get mining going. He's trying to get mining going so that those assets in the ground count for, uh, for uh, the valuation of the U.S. dollar. They're looking to do that. So he is doing that. He's going he's gonna to love uh, uh, the, uh, the, the gold find in California. He's going to love Northern Dynasty. He's going to do everything he can. Why? Because these are the elements that go into making up the value of your national currency. What are your thoughts on Tombstone? A Tombstone is go going, I think Tombstone is going to go when Liberty Star goes. That's a, they're, they're one and the same. They're a part of the same package. And I think Tombstone is going to go at the same time. And, and there's going to be a day when, uh, because of this new structure, as you're looking at this new structure, your assets in your ground and your mines are one of the major factors that set the value of your currency. And that is going to be a hot thing in the future. So take a look at that. The... Um, uh, and uh, let's go here. Uh, this, are, uh, this is a map that shows the currency pegs. This is, this is the United States is shown here in orange. And then currencies that are pegged uh, uh, to the United States dollar are, li uh, I mean, li uh, in li literally are shown uh, in more of a uh, uh, milder orange color, you know, they're linked, linked. And then there's a flexible tie is in the yellow ones to the U.S. dollars. So you can see that that's uh, the case then. The Eurozone, you can see that some are tied to the Euro, like these African nations are tied to the Euro, some, some in there. And then, uh, and then some nations are pegged to a basket of currencies, uh, you know, and so you see this happening down here in South Africa, they're pegged to a basket of currencies. But right now, that's what uh, is happening in the, uh, the world of finance, uh, how the, the nations are, are pegged to the dollar, but generally, everybody is somehow a pegged to or involved with the U.S. dollar. Uh, here is, here is the, if we take 100% of all currencies out there, uh, this was up to 19 through 1913. You can see the U.S. dollar uh, in in, in uh, was was this is about 50 per, uh, 60 percent. So you can see uh, we're about 64 percent or so of the world economy are using U.S. dollars. And the euro, this has been uh, the case. You can see the others are, are less. This did not have the yuan included because this was only what was officially called reserve currencies, the yuan has now been added and that's been, been increasing. But you can see, the point was to see how much U.S. dollars are going to be involved here and what, do you, what happens with a collapsing euro. You can see, because uh, we're coming into a really dynamic period where there's going to be a major change in those areas. Uh, we've seen that one. Let's take a look at this. This is emerging markets uh, that are, are, are coming out. Uh, you'll see that uh, the United, United States is over here. Uh, the uh, the uh, emerging markets currently comprise only 11% of global equity uh, markets. But the, the BRICS, uh, BRICS are over here. Uh, and uh, we, uh, you know, we see other emerging markets. You're getting a feel for the overall uh, feel of the of the world uh, financial system. Now, I wanted to get to this, 
which was what we call the Great Transition. And this is the great transition to the new dollar, uh, to the new financial system in the world. And uh, this first phase over here uh, uh, in the transition, we're going to have a liquidity crisis. And uh, we, we're beginning to see that. What are they doing? Uh, the Federal Reserve has stopped um, quantitative easing. And now they're actually talking about selling their quantitative easing all the bonds that they bought. So the, in the first phase, uh, the world th uh, throws fear at everybody. They have a liquidity crisis, they throw fear, there's no quantitative, no more quantitative easings. Markets begin to fall. We have a sell-off of, of assets, including gold, because people are selling whatever they can. Uh, when you run out, when you have a liquidity crisis, you sell whatever you have. You end up with capital controls, which we see many nations beginning to do. We may have a new Treasury Reserve note. There'll be, uh, with a new note, you'll have to turn in old currency because it'll become uh, inadequate after a while, it won't be any good. We'll have to balance a budget. That is, you have, and so we're talking about that right now. Congress is talking about a balanced budget. And, uh, and then we said, well, we'll get a Keystone Pipeline will be approved in exchange for the 2010 re IMF 2010 reforms. The 2010s uh, forms have been accomplished and the Keystone Pipeline has now been approved. So we see these things happening. That's, that was like phase one. This is our fear thing. Then we throw in new hope. And the new hope is this, that the IMF is going to provide new SDR liquidity. They're going to start pro providing liquidity uh, in the form of new money. Uh, instead of the U.S. dollar doing that, it'll be the SDR doing that. And uh, there'll, be, there'll be a bail-in settlement of bad banks. They have set it up where uh, we're, uh, we're going to have to bail out our banks if we're a part of them. Uh, and if the bank has a lo losing, they're going to be able to take some of the money of their uh, clients in the bank and use it to, to settle. Uh, and then they have to exchange and set, give us some shares in the bank. Uh, New World Financial System is coming, which we've just been talking about. There's going to be a, a, a debt settlement. There are many nations that are so far in debt they'll never get out. So they have to be a, a settlement and a restructure. And for many nations, it'll seem like a jubilee that they'll have their they'll have their they'll have their debt uh, reduced and uh, and canceled. It'll be like a jubilee. Then we're going to come to a new phase of expansion. Uh, with the new SDR liquidity, we're going to see, start seeing super mega projects. They're going to be the new Silk Road economic belt, the 21st century maritime Silk Road, uh, the you know, mega humanitarian projects, Africa, Asia, South America, Eastern Europe. Uh, UN is going to ban hunger and poverty by 2030. They're going to put in programs to actually do that. And then we have the G20 is going to start their global infrastructure initiative. And uh, which are they going to build, uh, for instance, uh, railroads and schools and medical centers all over Africa and etc. cetera, you know, all this kind of stuff. So when in the future during this timeline do you think that gold mining stocks will become more valuable? They, uh, they're going to become valuable right, uh, right in here. They're going to start right at this point right here. Phase two. Uh, which is between phase one and two, and which appears to be that same line between the seven years of famine and the seven years of plenty. It's between that, those two. Between the, that, that seems to be the same line. We're, right now? Today. Today. That day. Today. We're on, we're on that day, April 22nd, wow. 2017. So, so thank you, honey. The, uh, let's take a, look at, uh, take a look at this. And, uh, uh, and so one of the ways that they have, uh, they're going to do this is through uh, honoring uh, different historical bonds and uh, different fraudulent gold deals that have been done in the past. Uh, you've talked, to, I talked to you about how that there's much more gold in the world than the world than the world admits. Uh, I think there's in excess of tw uh, t uh, two million metric tons of gold, while the world says there's about 177,000 metric tons of gold. You know, essentially, 
And so uh, what we see is this. Uh, here's um, this from J.C. Collins, Philosophy of, of Metrics. He says, here's the apparent plan. In part one, we, introduced, we were introduced to the 1913 Chinese gold reorganization loan bonds. A final payout of, of, on these bonds is indeed in the works and is one part of the overall 2010 code of reforms process. Every time a deal was to be finalized with the bonds, it corresponded to the debt ceiling debate and um, code of reforms within Congress. So basically what he's saying is this. Uh, he's summarizing it in just a sentence, but uh, let me expand on that a little bit. This is a Chinese government bond. This is, uh, you can see here, uh, you probably can't see, but this is the 1913 bond that he's talking about. Uh, this one is for 25 million uh, pounds sterling, which in, in, in 1913 was equivalent to about $5 a pound. And uh, this was a bond uh, at that particular, and this is in different languages. Uh, this is in English over here on the left-hand side. And it says the Chinese government 5% reorganization gold loan of 1913. That is, this is uh, done in, uh, uh, in pound sterling, but it is in uh, gold backed. Gold backed pound sterling 1913. What happened? The Chinese did not honor these bonds. People around the world bought these bonds and were, not, were, un, were unable to, uh, and let me just, let me just go over here and find, I'll just read this, this one paragraph. From 1900 to 1940, uh, the Chinese government issued millions of dollars in sovereign debt, most notably a large tranche of $25 million pound uh, notes issued at 5% in 1913, set to mature in 1960. This massive bond funded the modernization of China's infrastructure and was widely acquired at the time by governments, banks, and uh, investors across the globe. However, in 1938, China defaulted on its binding engage engagement upon the government of the Republic of China and its successors, leaving millions of global creditors unpaid in accordance with the terms of the bond, successor government doctrine and accounting standards, the United States can and should hold China accountable to its obligations. The Chinese bonds in question are held throughout the world by treasuries, banks, companies, and over 2,000 private U.S. investors, many of which are active in seeking remuneration. Critically, the U.S. De uh, Treasury and Department of Justice and State are understood to hold substantial portions of this Chinese foreign debt. That's right. The U.S. Treasury and Departments of Justice and State have actually been out trying to acquire this from uh, local, the local U.S. citizens. And they don't always use the most ethical ways of acquiring this. These holdings have not been fully cataloged, nor has the U.S. government moved to hold China accountable for its debt obligations. What we're doing is we're holding this debt over them, which was a gold debt. China is eager to, to be recognized by the international trade and financial community as a market economy. However, in order to be regarded as a responsible and reliable participant in international commerce and finance, China must acknowledge and rectify its multitude rec transgressions against the United States and the World Trade Over Organization. So what we're talking about here is China wanted to be a part of the uh, World Trade, or, Trade Organization, but you, you have to follow the rules. The rules are you can't have outstanding debts and fraudulent things and all kinds of stuff that you've done. You have to be settled, all debts, everything has to be settled, everything has to come together. So what we're having now, right now is going on, is a massive restructuring of debt in the world and with the, the honoring of all fraudulent debt. Every bond deal that any nation has ever put out and is not honored is going to is, is coming coming up and must be honored and must be go negotiated and settled. So we're in this grand settlement time that's been going on for the last 10 or 20 years. They've been in this period for 10 years really strong trying to get all these factors settled. 
because it's hard because governments keep changing and stuff keeps happening and governments are overthrown and uh, who's responsible for the debt and uh, all that. So you can see the Chinese government bond there. That's the bond that we're talking about uh, in, in involved. Here is, uh, here's another one. This is, this, this is the 27th year uh, gold loan of the Republic of China issued in 1938 in United States dollar bonds and, uh, and you, this is for 50 uh, million dollars and these are coupons and what you would do if you own this bond you would every year you would clip a coupon you see one of them has been clipped here you would clip a coupon and you would submit it to the to the Chinese government and they would pay you your interest each year you would clip a coupon submit it they would pay you with your interest on them so uh, that's what they, they look at what happened that they did not honor well why didn't they honor well there's a several different reasons one is uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, was at war with Mao Zedong in China and eventually Chiang Kai-shek uh, took uh, much of China's gold and went to Taiwan. We called it Formosa at the time. And he took the gold uh, from China with him and he went to went there. Well, what happened was uh, that was the gold that was going to be used to pay these loans. You know? <laughs> so then what happens, we had, we had Japan come in and take over major portions of China, and uh, the uh, and uh, and when they did that, they they raped all the gold that they could find in China and other areas, Indonesia, and they took and stashed all that gold that they could find from from China uh, and Indonesia, they ch the, and uh, uh, parts of Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, other areas. The gold was was captured and taken and hidden in uh, in caves and bunkers in uh, the Philippines and in uh, Indonesia. So now uh, the gold that was going to be used by China to service these bonds, which their intention was to service these bonds, had been uh, uh, confiscated and was buried uh, there. Well, over the years, uh, some of that gold was found in the Philippines. And, that, uh, and uh, one of the guys that uh, ended up with his hands on it was Marcos of the Philippines. And he became the wealthiest guy in the world. And he took and he stashed a bunch of that gold in, uh, in a mountain behind his home. He had a uh, home uh, in, uh, in, up in the mountains, which was during the summer he would go there because the temperatures were so much nicer. And uh, there's a mountain he hollowed it out and made a great big vault. And he stashed his gold uh, that he had found in these different areas that the Japanese had, uh, had uh, buried it. And he stashed it there. And then uh, uh, when Ronald Reagan was in office, uh, the uh, United States military came in and kidnapped the Marcoses, uh, brought them to Hawaii, and put them on trial. You remember a show trial in the uh, Marcoses? And at the same time, the United States government uh, well, you say the United States government, I don't know which part of the government is a vague uh, area, whether it's the CIA, whether it's, uh, you know, what some, some, some aspect of the U.S. government captured all of that gold and brought it to, to the United States of America. We think that gold was most likely stored in the basement of the Twin Towers. That was the gold. So basically what you had was now China owed all this money in gold on these bonds over these years with all the penalties and interest and all the stuff that goes on top of it. And the gold that they were going to pay for it is actually in New York, in the uh, Twin Towers in New York City. And we have control of it. So this is the game that's been being played. This is, this, this is what you call, what do they call it? The ultimate game? This is the game that's played behind the scenes. The big boys play these games, uh, and uh, and uh, nobody really knows what's going. Newspapers don't report on it except in very vague 
uh, plans. So basically what, uh, what J.C. Collins is pointing out here is this. Uh, he says, in part one, we were introduced to the 1913 Chinese Gold Reorganization Loan Bonds. A final payment on these bonds is indeed in the works, which is going on right now. They're going to pay out these bonds. So they're going to honor these bonds. Uh, the Chinese are. Uh, and, uh, and that's a part of the 2010 Code of Reforms. What does that mean? The 2010 Code of Reforms. Why would you that negotiate the, something like that? What the 2010 IMF Code of Reforms was this. The Code of Reforms uh, brought in China to the IMF. It, uh, it put the, the People's Bank of China director on the board of the IMF as the vice chairman. And the IMF increased their quotas. They doubled the, uh, the monies that the nations had to put in. That is, an SDR is created by all these people, nations putting in money. The United States puts in U.S. dollars and Britain puts in pounds and whatever. All they put in all this money and then they create SDRs out of that. Well, what they did was they, they doubled the amount of the, uh, that every, every nation had to put in and uh, China was uh, required to put in and money as well and so uh, they put in um, uh, extra. So what they did was they, uh, this reorganization gave China a seat at the financial table of the IMF. It's not about uh, quota reforms. They talk about IMF quota reforms. That's meaningless. The quota is nothing. It's, it's China has, has its teeth in the IMF and has con some controlling power and major influence in the IMF. That's what they did uh, as a part of that. Uh, and then he makes this, this thing. This deal to do this reconciliation uh, has been going on for years. And it looks like it's going to happen and then it falls apart. And every time it looks like it's going to happen is when the U.S. is having a debt crisis. The budget ceiling debt crisis. Every time. And so I believe that this debt ceiling uh, crisis, we said, it's just on purpose or not. I think it's absolutely on purpose. I think we're not going to see uh, things work out. I think eventually we're going to see crisis in this situation, and it's all a part of international jockeying uh, for, to get some negotiation. Because, why? N nations are negotiating, the, signing off on the final things on this right now on this re, uh, re-establishment of debt. Uh, the, uh, it's important to know that China, uh, by China honoring the 1913 bonds, will be able to access their full gold reserves, including the portion that was used to support the 1913 bonds. What he's inferring to is this. That China uh, said that Shanghai Shek took all the gold, and therefore we can't honor these bonds. But in reality, they had gold there on hand where they could have, but it would have really strained them to have honored these bonds. So they hid the gold that they actually had on hand and uh, uh, so, that, so that they did not have to honor these bonds. Because if they, if they were found in default, they were going to have to, uh, uh, they would be kicked out of any kind of international trade. They wouldn't be able to, and how are you going to sell all your goods from China if you can't be a part of international trade? trade. You know, you're, you're an exporting country. So uh, what we found was uh, the, the first thing we discovered is when Hong Kong was controlled by the British and the, uh, China wanted it back, Britain said, in order to get Hong Kong back, you must honor these 1913 gold bonds. So uh, what they did for all British individuals or banks they honored the 1913 bonds and they paid 10% of their face value to the people uh, in, uh, that settled, settled for this. And most, mostly these bonds were not then controlled by, by Britain. This was all kept under the table. Nobody, uh, you know, this was in small print in the, uh, in the negotiations. But we knew that uh, with that, that these 1913 bonds would eventually be honored for all nations because they have now were honored for the Brit Britain uh, in there. Uh, 
Uh, he says, with that being said, the bonds will not be honored at their full face value. So I don't know. I think it's about 10%. It may be more for, in some cases. The problem uh, with it, you can't uh, honor them at full face value. Why? Because they're worth so much today, it would completely distort the whole financial system. I mean, it would just be, people would be getting hundreds of trillions of dollars. You know, because of all the time and penalties and interest and stuff on these bonds. Uh, like any debt consolidation, all sovereign debt must be included. The owners of the Chinese bonds will get their payouts. The payout itself is based on a, a flat amount already set for the historical bonds. That is, there might be lots of bonds out there, uh, but uh, more or, or less people might be, uh, uh, might be included in the bonds. Uh, but the, it doesn't uh, it doesn't change the payout. The payout is the same. That's been pre-negotiated, uh, negotiated, and so uh, the amount is uh, is specifically valued within the renminbi's uh, SDR composition. The more bondholders that come forward forward will decrease the individual payout for each bondholder. That's basically it. So the uh, um, and so. Uh, this uh, in uh, this uh, uh, approval of the IMF 2010 reforms was a hot button because uh, Congress had to approve it, and if you uh, voted to approve it, you were voting for the destruction of the U.S. dollar. Is essentially what it was. So nobody they fussed over this for years, and nobody wanted to do it, so what they did was they put it in the budget bill in small print in 2015. In small print, and people just voted for the budget, and by, the, by doing so, we voted to uh, release the dollar from U.S. world reserve currency status, and the demand for the dollar uh, is going to fall dramatically because of that. As, and so we're just entering that period of time right now. Uh, and uh, since most countries have sovereign debt and outstanding historical bonds, it stands to reason that other situations like the Chinese bonds will be handled in similar fashion. Yes, there's lots of different nations have debt. A lot of them have fraudulent bonds, things they haven't fully honored, etc. They are going to be happen. J Japan has what's called the 57s. They're going to be honored uh, and all of that. Uh, but. Uh, uh, another pattern that emerges as we study the history of reserve currencies is that with each reserve currency, the centralization has become tighter and tighter. The control of money, that is. Through increased centralization, the countries of the world have sunk deeper into sovereign debts uh, from which even more centralized centralization will be offered as the solution. Make no mistake about it, the power the United States has experienced since 1944 and the Bretton Woods Agreement has come from the reserve status of the U.S. dollar. After the reforms are passed and the executive board restructured, the U.S. will become a regular country like every other country in the world. And that's exactly where we're, we're headed. Uh, uh, He says here, uh, from the moment the reforms are implemented, the dollar will see multiple devaluations staged to coincide with multi-stage restructuring of the debt. This is, all, this is a big thing in the world, so it has to be done in steps, and each step has to kind of be resolved as it, as it happens. It is important to mention that with the passage of the reforms, the world will not see an overnight immediate response. The new system will take time to fully integrate the global currency reset will happen in levels as currencies are allowed to free float within the parameters as set forth by the SDR composition of each country. And uh, the Basel III regulations, which are controlling a lot of this from the Bank of International Settlements, are also set to be fully implemented by 2018. So if this has all been set, uh, um, you know, in the, in the marketplace. With the full implement, implementation of these reforms, we will see all the currencies of the world that are now pegged to the value of the U.S. dollar shift to a more balanced system of 
of weight values be pegged to the value of the SDR as issued by the International Monetary Fund. So uh, we see that's the kind of the, the general plan. To know when this is going to be happening, we have what we call uh, signs of the times. And I've got to put, the, put this up on the board because these are important. There are uh, several major signs, or a few major signs, let's put it that way. Uh, the first is going to be the Fed is going to taper uh, quantitative easing. So what have we done? They've already doing that. They're not buying uh, in the marketplace. They're already quant uh, tapering quantitative easing. The next thing that's going to happen is we're going to see two. We're going to see um, the IMF is going to provide SDR quantitative easing, QE, liquidity. They're going to provide liquidity. They're going to do quantitative easing. So we see this one's happening already, and we're seeing this one starting to happen. Three, what you're going to see is U.S. bases uh, withdrawn around the world. Why? The only way we can afford U.S. bases all around the world, these 135 major bases that we have around the world in all these different nations, is because we can create currency out of for nothing out of nothing and spend it in the local economy for our bases for our soldiers and for supplies etc and then those dollars don't come back to the United States because the local economy needs them to do business as a reserve currency so what happens is watch for uh, in the budget negotiations and all the stuff coming up if you hear closing US bases no that all these things are all happening. This is all a part of the grand restructuring in the world, the new financial restructuring, and it means the collapse of the U.S. dollar by major portions, uh, and, uh, and as the U.S. dollars that we have created around the world begin to come home. So watch for those, those three signs. Those are literally happening right now, and where we will see it is when, we, when you take a look at... Uh, Federal holders of, of federal, I mean, foreign holders of federal debt. When we look at we look at that report every once in a while to see how it's doing, we will notice that holders of federal U.S. debt will begin to decline. The debt will be, begin to decline, and we will see that uh, see that happening. And as he says here, uh, expect more of the same as the system shifts further away from the dollar and closer the, to the SDR composition. America could never openly admit that they, they killed the dollar. It will have to be hidden within a series of events, of events which create a form of plausible deniability. That's exactly what the government has done. It's exactly what Congress has done. They are killing the dollar. And of course, what has happened? You and I have uh, prospered because the dollar has been unfairly uh, you know, increased in value. I mean, that's it. We've been the recipients of the, of the value. Now we're going to get a little bit of the negative uh, side of that. So what do we do? Inflationary? We know gold and silver uh, uh, is going in U.S. dollars is going to go up uh, tremendously. The commodities that we saw, uh, the grains are going to go up incredibly. All these things. Inflation is going to go up. Property values are going to go up, and eventually uh, uh, the uh, uh, job uh, uh, salaries will eventually go up as well. Uh, let's take a look at, uh, there's another uh, thing, uh, and I'll just cover this uh, verbally. Uh, the other, other thing is this, over the years, uh, there's another classification of, of uh, uh, gold, uh, and this is, this is called the, 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 the Global Debt Facility. After World War II, <coughs> these very, uh, all these people that have these massive riches from gold from Asia, which they had hundreds of thousands of metric tons of gold in different uh, periods, 
<laughs> it's not like 9999 fine. It's just a stuff that has been created over hundreds of years. Uh, uh, offered this gold up to bail out the world after World War II. And they created what was called the Global Debt Facility uh, uh, and, and collateral. This was the collateral for the debt facility. They provided, uh, I don't know, was it 86,000 uh, metric tons of gold to bail out the nations of the world, refinance after World War II, and etc. They put forth their gold and they were issued uh, uh, deposit receipts, and, you know, similar to these bonds that we have here for their gold. But then the banks uh, decided they were going to uh, hold on to the gold for themselves and they didn't apply it to the nations and all the national debt and they didn't use it to rebuild the, the, the nations, they just kept the money. And so this, this gold, which was to bail out the nations of the world and uh, actually zero out the debt of all kinds of nations in the world, which would, had been offered, has been uh, hijacked and controlled by uh, several major banks. Uh, that gold is now coming forth. It is going to be a part of the restructuring. That gold is now coming forth. They're, dra they're dragging it back from the banks. Here's what the banks did. They signed an agreement with the parties that brought the, the gold in and deposited uh, this gold. Uh, and sometimes they deposit 20,000 tons in a bank, 10,000 tons, etc., of metric uh, tons of gold in a bank. And the bank would issue them documents saying what what had been done and making it, but, uh, and they would have a document for the person and they have a document for the bank. Now in each document, they created spelling errors, misspelled words, all kinds of stuff, and uh, in each document. And the parties were told at the time uh, that this was a special code that was put in the, in the, uh, in the documents so that uh, uh, the documents wouldn't wouldn't be forged, or uh, because and they would have an identical key there. So, what happened was a um, uh, people came back later and said, "Look, you guys haven't paid us. We haven't been getting uh, the interest on what we've given, and you haven't used the gold for the purposes that you said that we were going to use it for. Uh, and uh, we're uh, we want our money." And uh, they said, "Well, show us what you've got." And they showed them their uh, their document, and they said, "Well, look, you have." All these spelling errors in the uh, in your document, this absolutely has been this has been forged by a very ignorant Filipino or Indonesian per per person who doesn't even understand English, and uh, and therefore they said we cannot verify that you are the owner of the gold, and so because they couldn't verify that well, that they were the owner, the bank got to got to keep it and do whatever they want, so they used this collateral for loans and they used, they used it any way they wanted. They leased it out to others. They did all kinds of stuff uh, with this gold. So basically what's happening is the banks are being called on this that are involved. Citibank, uh, HSBC, all the big banks are all, all involved in this. Uh, Wells Fargo, they're all, all the big banks are involved uh, in, in this uh, situation. So uh, the, uh, they're being called on this. So this gold is being coughed up and being a, put a part of the new reconciliation jubilee bailout of nations. So what this new uh, thing is, they're they're putting all the debts together and they're putting all these assets together, and they're going to try and cancel things out and and set it up at that particular time. Uh, so that is uh, that's what I have uh, on that, and so that is happening now. And we could, we won't go through all this other stuff. Uh, this is Ken's story. I'd like to take a minute or two to uh, tell you about what our business and ministry is, investing with insight. Uh, what you are looking at is our, uh, our uh, website on uh, Facebook. We post here uh, uh, frequently. We have videos and all kinds of interesting articles, prophetic revelation. Uh, let's go over here and take a look at uh, our investingwithinsight.com website. This is where we uh, we post a lot of our information, a lot of dreams and revelations are posted here uh, with people, for people. Uh, we see what the Lord is saying and we see how we might be able to invest and protect our families and our, our businesses at this time. Let's go over here to our, uh, this is our uh, 
our website that we run on Kajabi. This is for our paying members only. And uh, uh, we have, uh, here we have, we post all of our videos, um, uh, all of our, uh, our special reports. We have resources and watch lists and special reports. We have our meetings, we have prophetic revelation. We have our top picks of our top stocks, our penny stocks, this kind of thing that the Lord has shown us. And I want you to, to get an idea because as a member you'll get a, uh, you will have a part of this. Let's go over here. Let's say uh, you joined us. Well, every Saturday morning we have a, um, uh, a presentation or online. We broadcast online. You can see here we got two days and 19 hours to go here before we do our next one. The, um, uh, and we have a chat area over here on the right. You can see where people can chat and they can talk back and forth about what's going on, be a part of the community. We have people around the world on, um, on several different continents that are all a part of this on uh, Saturday mornings. Then, uh, then what happens is we also have people who are traders. And so every, um, every week um, I provide, I mean every day I provide uh, a, a stock uh, list of where you can invest based on the, the where the market is for this particular day based on our prophetic stocks as you can see right here uh, I'm shorting the market I'm sh the, the DUG I'm shorting uh, energy uh, the VIX this is I, I'm saying that there's going to be a lot of uh, volatility in the market so the VIX will go up I'm still in Apple uh, I'm shorting China I'm going long US Treasuries I'm shorting gold, uh, uh, silver here, and I'm shorting gold mining companies here. So you can kind of see how we're doing. Right now we're averaging about 66% um, APR, and we've been doing this for 631 days. So you can kind of see uh, trading days. Uh, over here we'll take a look at uh, some of our other resources that we have uh, that you would be available to you. We have, we have watch lists, special reports, uh, recommended tools and services, how to invest. We have training classes, 16 basic training class, plus we have an archive of all of our past re resources. There's a forum that goes along with it as well. And then over here, uh, I'd like to, like to show you, uh, we have our tweets. Every day we have tweets going out. Uh, uh, we tweet out our, uh, our daily trading, plus uh, all my trades are tweeted out, uh, plus uh, any important articles or per important uh, prophetic revelation that's coming out, we tweet that out to everyone. And so, um, for instance, if you would um, like to, uh, uh, to join up with us, what we have here is you just basically go to um, the store and uh, you can click on becoming a member. And we have, um, we have, it's normally $407 a year for an annual membership. And you get essentially weekly meetings. Uh, we, we, we do skip once in a while. You can do $47 monthly membership or a $407 annual membership. And we have specials that we're running from time to time. And you can take a look at those, those specials. So uh, basically, uh, that's what we are. That's who we are. And... Uh, it's been great talking to you, and we bless you. Hope you will join our prophetic investing community.